Oh, welcome to Thunder Nerds. I'm Brian Hinton. I'm Sarah Veseloff. And I'm Frederick Philip Von Weiss. And thank you for consuming the Thunder Nerds, a conversation with the people behind the technology that love what they do. And do tech good. Good. Pow. Bam. Boom. Hey, we're doing tech good here, everybody. And we have a wonderful sponsor. All you're helping us do just that. We have Pantheon.io. If you don't know Pantheon, they provide a platform for WordPress or Drupal. And I guess it would be apropos to say uh, if you're using a headless content management system with uh, with one of those, you could probably do that with a headless WordPress. Um, they provide a dev test and live environment. They vet all your kind of security updates before you push it up. So you could push it to your dev environment, see how it jives. And then if you don't like it, you could revert. You do all your stuff get or sftp if that's your flavor uh, i don't know why but you could and um yeah it's just a really cool platform so check them out at pantheon.io brian yeah and you know what else you should check out our show on youtube we have thousands well now hundreds of videos on there now with all our guests uh, covering conferences and speaking to some pretty awesome people uh check us out subscribe uh, and click that little notification bell because YouTube makes it difficult to be notified. You got to make sure to do that as well. Uh, I'm sure our guests, when we get to him, knows what, it, what I'm talking about. And uh, go to your platform of choice, iTunes, uh, Spotify, you name it, subscribe and leave us a review at thundernerds.io forward slash review. Yeah, I would really appreciate it. Thanks so much. And uh, with all that being said, why don't we go ahead and get to our guest? Let's welcome software architect, developer advocate, designer, speaker, AKA Blitz Jackson himself, and I'm sure we'll get into that, Jason Legstorff. Welcome to the show, Jason. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, I know you're a busy guy and doing a lot of projects, even though you keep your time boxed to a certain, uh, certain level of this and that, and we'll jump into that when we get to that part of the show. So where are you, uh, where are you actually joining us from? Uh, I am joining you from Portland, Oregon. Love the Portlands. Haven't been there in a long time. That's where they have the gum wall too, right? The which one? The gum wall? Or am I thinking Seattle? Uh, if you know if there's gum, gum wall? wall in Portland, I'm not familiar with it. Uh Maybe it's not there. Maybe it is Seattle. There's one of those places that's in that part of the country that I really enjoy yeah. that I have a favorite memory of a gum wall. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I, I, I love the Portland. Uh, I haven't been in a long time. It's probably been like four years. Really enjoy it. Um, are you originally from there or have you, did you come from somewhere else? And what um, was- I'm originally from Montana. I grew up uh, about an hour south of the Canadian border, a town called Whitefish. It's near Glacier National Park, if you've heard of that. And then um, in pursuit of my dreams of being a rock star, moved to Missoula, Montana, thinking that was, you know, bright lights, big city. Uh, as you can imagine, that did not work out. And uh, from from my, my doomed rock star days, I learned just enough web dev to start taking clients. And I moved to Portland for um, what I called geographic credibility. Because when you tell people that you're a web dev in Montana, they, they tend to raise an eyebrow. Uh, but when you tell people you're a web dev from Portland, they assume that you're super cool and really good at it. That's so funny. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting how we associate technology with certain locations. I remember I was listening to an episode of Bread Time and uh, they, the guy was talking about, I forget which one it was, but he was talking about how he was looking for jobs as a UX designer and he couldn't find anything good locally in Tampa. So he got a Google phone number and got a area code for uh, San Francisco and then changed his address on his website to San Francisco. And then he got hired in a week and then after that moved to San Francisco. But that's how he used that geographic location to communicate Mm -hmm. his, um, you know, degree of edgeability or uh, success in the industry because of that location. So odd. You could, you could have stayed in Minnesota. <laughs> in where? 
No, or wait, was it Minnesota or Montana? Montana. 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 Dang it. Ah, see, go. That's ball. okay. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, uh, it was very close. So, Jason, what kind of music? What? Tell us. So, you said rock star. That might not actually be rock, but it, it could be. It, Tell us a little bit about music. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, was the lead singer of an emo band. Um, and so emo music for everyone who wasn't a high school student between the exact years of 2003 and 2007 um, was a form of, of like whiny punk music that occasionally got angry and screamy. And uh, so I wrote a lot of songs about roses and broken hearts and blood they were all very sad and um we <laughs> we Please toured for about pictures. <laughs> there there are pictures yeah it's still on spotify you can find it my band still has music on the internet oh, oh, let um, me interject then what's the uh what's the name of the band so we can put that in the show notes it's called minus my thoughts perfect that is a yes. very emo <laughs> Applause. Yeah, and, and you will see uh, you'll see pictures of me. I had hair. Um, it was dyed black. It was swooped down over one side. I had the the eyeliner and was. all the piercings, and uh, you know I used to wear pants that were way too tight. And it was uh, you know it was a it was a it was a moment in time. Um, but because we were an emo band, we were not very good. And because we were not very good, we didn't make very much money. But we did tour for like two years. We lived in a van. Uh, went around the country, uh, well, the western part of the country, like from about Denver west. We would uh, we would tour in a loop, and we just played shows every night. We did about 200 shows a year, and we made enough money to have gas money, but we mostly slept in our van. We mostly ate dollar menu stuff. So I had to, I kind of volunteered to be the web designer, the band manager, the booking agent, the, you know, we, I did a lot of the work of operating the band. So when the band broke up, I started looking at what I wanted to do next. And I realized that I liked, I was good at all of the things except actually being a musician. So how could I use all of these other skills that I'd learned and do something different? It turned out uh, web design and, and web development were, uh, were a viable path. It's so interesting how, I don't know, Brian, maybe you, you'll agree with me here. Probably 60%, more. possibly more people that we've spoken with start their career where it's some kind of musical uh, beginnings where they, you know, they have a band, they create flyers, they create a website, and then mm -hmm. it turns into their main career. You know, they start doing that for other bands and so forth. It's very similar to your story. Would you agree, Brian? Yeah, and, and it's funny. I, I always think, like, imagine if, like, I don't know, the Taylor Swift, Beyonce, they're like, just didn't succeed. Beyonce then started developing websites. <laughs> it's just funny how, you know, musicians always, uh, it seems to be a path. Like, if you're either you're become a graphic designer and you're just designing, you know, you know band flyers or you're making the website and <laughs> this thing, you know, you're working in that field. Yeah. So so that took you to web design. Let's let's jump and make the connection with this bridge. So you're doing web design. How did you go from that to say working at uh, what what you previously were doing or or what you're doing now? Um. So I yeah I've kind of just always pursued things that I'm curious about, and I in the band started out doing just design. I do flyers. I, you know, would draw up like merch designs and, and those sorts of things. I, I designed our album art. And then when we needed a, we had a MySpace page and we wanted to make that look cool. So I was like, well, I can probably figure out a little bit of this. And it was, it was fun. So I learned the CSS to customize a MySpace page. And then uh, MySpace started to get less cool. So I built a, like a website. And I remember building a really it was like a rough uh, table-based sliced up image kind of, of website. Um, and then yeah. actually enjoyed it. Like I thought it was fun, so I did it again. And then I was like, well, what if I could embed our music, but I don't want people to be able to download it. So how could I do that? And so I learned flash and I built a little flash music player. And then I wanted to do some, some more. So I wanted the band to be able to write updates without having to edit code. So I built a little peak CMS and, and I just kept chasing things I was interested in. And once I built the CMS, 
I um, then had it in my head, you know, because 19 year old me was a genius. I was like, I'm going to build the WordPress killer. And so I, <laughs> I started using my CMS for clients, um, then spent the second half of my career undoing all that damage. Um, but we, you know, so I, I built that PHP CMS. I started writing about what I was doing. Uh, Chris Coyer at CSS Tricks gave me my first break, um, published one of my articles on building a simple PHP CMS. It was, um, it was a beginner level article that was presented like more than that. And so it hit the front page of dig and then got torn to shreds by people who actually knew what they were doing. Um, but it also landed me a book deal. So it kind of kicked off my whole career. And from there, I was able to grow my agency to the point where it was, you know, I had 12 contractors, a couple full-time employees and burned myself the hell out. I, I kind of, I was good at hiring people to do design and development because I knew those skill sets. They were, they were close to my heart. They were things that I had a lot of experience doing, but I didn't have any experience hiring salespeople or uh, people to do admin or accounting or, or any of the things that keep a business running. I didn't, I didn't have those skill sets, so I didn't know how to hire for them. So I just kept them to myself. I couldn't delegate. So I ended up optimizing myself into a corner where all I was doing was like the sales and admin and, and keeping the lights on. And I didn't get to do any of the stuff that I liked. And it was stressing me out so badly that I like, at one point my beard started falling out of my head in clumps. It, I just stressed myself to alopecia, right? And um, that kind of was my, my reckoning, you know, I was like, all right, let's, let's have a little come to Jesus here and think about what's, what's really important in life. And that led me to, um, I honestly, I like took a, a 10 day vacation in Alaska with no internet connectivity to think about what I wanted to do. Um, came back, sold my agency, took a contract with one client who just wanted me to do web development. And that was a year, um, sold all my stuff, gave, uh, gave up my lease and just traveled the world for a couple of years partner. Um, and after two years, took a job with IBM as a front end architect. Um, and then after about 18 months there, I was trying to convert them over to use Gatsby. And I was talking to the Gatsby team and they, they kind of poached me across to do DevRel. Well, they actually hired me as an engineer and then I kind of naturally moved into DevRel. It was a kind of an organic thing. Um, and now I'm, doing what I do now, which is, I suppose, ho the host of an internet TV show. You know, what's really interesting is that story of how and why you lost uh, your beard hair, how you had that stress-induced alopecia. I, I watched one of the videos where you talked about this, and it was really interesting. And I think you provide some valuable lessons on I don't want to say a work-life balance, but it, it is, it's about balancing what you're doing and, and focusing on, on, on different kinds of aspects of your life and your professional career, right? It's, it's in mm -hmm. essence, you're talking about a lot of time boxing things and you actually even missed Thanksgiving with your family, which uh, eventually kind of led to all the other stress induced physical ailments. Uh, do you mind touching on that a little bit and, I'd love to jump into some of those lessons because I believe they're so powerful and everybody could really get a lot out of that. Yeah, definitely. So I, you know, I, um, when I had my agency, I, I had this idea in my head that the only way to really get ahead was to, to grind, you know, it's this idea of like hustle and grind. You got to be on, you got to have a, you know, your main gig and your side hustle and your side hustle for your side hustle. And, you know, you always have some, some number of dozens of irons in the fire. And I truly believed that that was the only way that I could get ahead. So I was writing a book, running an agency, trying to blog, trying to write guest articles, um, trying to build products on the side that I could sell. And in all of that, I was giving about, I feel like 5% effort in all of those directions and just burning the rest with context switching overhead. Like I, um, there's a, a kind of a general guideline that I'm forgetting the, uh, Gerald, what's his name? Gerald Weinberg. He has a, a general guideline on context switching costs, which is that for each task you add, you have a 20% context switching penalty, 
so if you are doing one task, 100% of your energy goes to that thing. If you're doing two tasks, 40% goes to one task, 40% to the other, and you lose 20% to context switching. Three tasks, and now 40% of your time is lost to context switching. And by the time you get up to five tasks, you might as well go home because you're literally doing nothing. Um, if, you, if you think about the way that CPUs work, this is called memory thrashing, which is where they spend so much time switching tasks that they actually don't do any work. And that's when your computer locks up and you it kind of shuts down. So our brains are like that. If we're trying to switch between tasks, there's this overhead associated with that where you, um, you know, to do creative work or to do something meaningful, you have to build up this mental context. I have a model of how the work goes. I've got the history. I've got the requirements, the goals. All those things have to be in my head before I can even start working. And so by the time I've built that mental model, when I get interrupted, I have to tear down that model and then build another mental model to start working on the next task. And so, you know, when I was, when I was at, had my agency, I think I spent all of my time building and tearing down models. I don't know that I was really getting anything meaningful done. And because of that, I had to work these really long, terrible hours to, just to get a normal eight hour days worth of work done. And I, you know, that led me to be overtired and that in and of itself has a whole, there's a whole other cost associated with that. I mean, I've got, there's a mountain of research about how unhealthy all this stuff is. You know, if you're, if you're not sleeping like six hours or less, per night of sleep is leaves you as mentally impaired as if you were above the legal limit for driving drunk. Um, if you are uh, working more than I think 50 hours for a sustained period of time per week, like after two to six weeks, your performance will actually dip below that of what you would have done working a regular 40 hour week because your exhaustion increases and you make so many mistakes in the extra hours that you have to, you spend more time fixing them then you would have just gotten work done in a, in a plane 40 hours. So like, there's all these things where you, you know, it's, you're trying to burn the candle at both ends, but what you end up doing is you, you kind of become the snake eating its own tail. You're, you're doing more damage than good in the pursuit of, of working harder and, you know, the grinding it out. Right. Um, and so that's what I was doing is I, I thought that if I just pushed harder, if I just grounded out that I would kind of break through to this other, this other side that I believed would be easy where I, you know, I'd done the work, I'd paid the dues, I'd put in the time and that would allow me to then coast. But I was, you know, I wasn't working smart. I was just pounding my head against a wall. Um, so when I, when I sold my agency, that gave me this space. It, it created a, an empty space in my life where I could think about like, what am I actually optimizing for here? Because when I had my agency, I was optimizing for work. I wanted to create a world around me where what I did was get the most amount of work done for the most amount of hours. And I was trying to do these productivity hacks, you know, four hour work blocks or, or like, um, polyphasic sleep at one point was a terrible doomed experiment that I tried. Um, all these things, you know, and, and had Soylent existed, I would have 100% been the guy who was trying to like only consume Soylent to, to maximize the number of minutes I had fingers on keyboard. Right. Um, so when I got to the agency side, I started thinking like, okay, well, what I'm actually optimizing for isn't work. What I'm optimizing for is the best possible life that I can have. And so that starts to change the reasoning about it. Why, what makes a good life? Well, to have a good life, you need to have like income. And that's why you work is to have income and the freedom to do the things that you want to do, right? They've proven that money does in fact buy happiness up to a point. I think in today's dollars, it's around a hundred grand a year. Once you've crossed that line, money won't buy you any more happiness. But up to that point, it legitimately will. It buys you security. It buys you peace of mind. It buys you, you know, like the ability to survive uh, financial setbacks. Like, you know, you can break your leg and it doesn't mean that you'll starve to death or go bankrupt. Um, the, so you're optimizing for that. You want that, that financial security. But beyond that, I'm not optimizing, you know, once you cross a hundred grand, you don't want to keep optimizing for money because now you're just, you're chasing a thing for that thing's sake. So you optimize for like, I want to have a good life. Having a good life means that I've got financial security, but it also means I've got time to spend with people that I care about. It also means that I am, I have the freedom to say, you know what? I don't want to work Friday nights. I would like to go to a movie or 
sit on my ass and watch Netflix or whatever it is that I want to, and I want to, I want to sit in a room with all the lights off and stare into space. And if I, if that's, what's going to make me happy, I need to have the, the freedom and the autonomy to make those choices. Um, but, but how do you uh, change? I mean, the, the, what the industry, unfortunately, seems to point people in the opposite direction of everything you're describing to the point that, you know, you, you're expected to have those four or five side projects. You're, you're expected to work those long hours and, oh, you don't have a, a green on every single day on GitHub? What is wrong with you? Um, how, do, how, does, how, how does the industry change? Uh, um, what, what advice would you give to people that feel that way? Um, I mean, I like, all I can say is my own experience because I, I think that, you know, I have just mountains of privilege in all sorts of different directions, right? Like I, you know, I come from a pretty stable home. I am one of the people who's fortunate enough that my hobby is writing code. And so this is a thing that I do for fun, um, which is not true for a lot of people. I don't have kids. I don't have tons of debt. I don't have anybody who depends on me. You know, I'm not taking care of a parent or, or relative who needs, who needs long-term care. Um, all of those things mean that I have options that are maybe not available to other people. So in, in my case, what I'm looking at is like, how do I multi-leverage my time? If I'm going to do something, how can I make sure that that thing does double or triple or quadruple duty so that I get the output of like having the, you know, multiple irons in the fire. I get the output of like showing outward uh, performance. I'm doing something that people can see. I'm creating content that lives on in perpetuity so that I've got my, uh, you, you know, if you Google me, there's a lot of stuff that shows up that, you know, I have a body of work. Um, can I put it in public so that it shows as GitHub contributions? Um, you know, all sorts of things like that. And, you know, it, when I was at IBM, the way that I did that is I figured out what their limits were for open sourcing something. And I like wrote a readme and open source the readme because it only requires manager approval to open source like less than 500 lines of code. So I just wrote a readme. I got approval to open source that. And then I built the whole project in open source because it was already open source. And then nobody ever asked me any questions about it. Um, and so that was a way for me to create public work and try to give back to the community and have something that was um, visible and, you know, also do my day job at the same time. And so it was kind of looking for like, what's my loophole so that I can do so that I can do that sort of thing without putting myself at, at professional risk, without obligating myself to need to work nights and weekends to, you know, contribute to open source if that's what I want to do. Um, but, and a lot of it too, I think is just recognizing that like externally, there will always be somebody who tells you that you're not doing enough, that you're not trying hard enough, that you should be finding more time that if you really, you know, if you really hardcore, if you really wanted to succeed, you would make the time, you know, they, there's always somebody who's going to tell you that. And I think that at, at the end of the day, you just got to trust yourself and, and know we all have limits, right? I, I know that I can do about X amount of work. And if I go beyond that, I'm less happy. My work suffers and I ultimately don't get any, there's no like added value. Right. How, how did you, um, what was the method you used to, I guess, measure your limits? Like, what, how did you know? Well, okay, my, this I, is I, I, I would <laughs> say mine, mine was not the healthy way because I drove myself right into the ground and then I slowly dug back up until I felt like I was normal again. <laughs> um, I, I think ways that I have seen people do it that are healthier is they will kind of track their happiness. One thing that I've done with, um, I have consulting clients that, that come to, that I work with for like this work-life balance stuff. And I've had them keep a journal where every day they just write down the task they did and, and give it an emoji rating of like happy face, neutral face, frowny face. And as they're doing their work, if we start seeing that, like, they're always frowny facing, what, you know, what are they doing? And if that's the case, is it time to do kind of an inventory? What do you do every day? And then chart it on a matrix of like, if the up and down is I'm really good at this and I'm really bad at this. And the left and right is I love this or I hate this. 
how many things that you do in an average day fall into the, I'm really good at this and I love this category. And how can you, how can you optimize like delegate or drop a responsibility or transfer to another job or something so that you get as much of your job into that? I'm really good at this. And I really love this category as possible. And a lot of that takes like having honest conversations with yourself. What am I really good at? What do I suck at? Um, I have people email their closest coworkers and friends and family to say, Hey, can you tell me what you think my biggest contributions are? Uh, like, what are my unique skills, the things that really add value? And then you kind of consolidate that advice to realize like, okay, my unique skills are X, Y, and Z. And that's what people see value in my work from. So how can I do more of those things? And hopefully those things line up with the stuff that I enjoy. I find that we tend to be better at the things that we, we, uh, that we kind of inherently enjoy because we try harder because they're fun. But, um, you know, there is always that, that case where like, Hey, you're really, really good at, at like organizing a mess. And you're like, Oh, I hate the management part. I just do it because it drives me nuts when it's not done. (laughs) Um, and, and, you know, and sometimes that's like, that's a thing. Like you can, you can find a way to do some of that work. Um, or, you know, now, you know, that's a thing that you need to find a way to delegate, find somebody who's better at it, who likes it and give them that job. That's awesome. Yeah. It's a lot of times yeah. you, when you, when you write that stuff down, you make a conscious kind of idea of, of the inventory of what you're doing. Uh, just, mm-hmm. I think there was a video that you had where you were talking about the same thing when somebody's trying to uh, limit their calories. If you, if you sit down and say, Oh, I'm, I'm eating a bag of chips and you write down, you're eating a bag of chips. Maybe you might make a, a different choice. It's mm-hmm. interesting how, you know, these different things, but yeah, you have a lot of interesting learnings that you're sharing with everyone. And I think we should probably, speaking of that, jump into learn with Jason. This is a really interesting subject. And I, I, if you could just first just start off by telling everybody what that is and um, we'll, we'll go from there. Absolutely. So learn with Jason is an internet TV show, I guess. I, <laughs> I get on Twitch and I pair program, or actually I just pair up with somebody from the community and they teach me something. And this has been one of the the most enjoyable things I've ever done because a lot of times this is gonna be programming. I've had, um, you know, I've got Sarah Jasner coming on in a, in a week or so. I, I, I just did, um, I like it just, the, the community is amazing in, in their willingness to show up and teach. And so I pair program with somebody from the community. They teach me something. Um, we do it live on Twitch in about 90 minutes or so. And we build something and, you know, chat along with folks. It's a lot of fun. And sometimes we do something that's not programming at all. Like on uh, Tuesday, I had uh, a producer named Joe. He goes by Steel Tip Dove. He came on and we just made a beat. And we pulled up Logic Pro X and just like made a beat. And it was amazing. It was so much fun. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's basically, I, I wanted a show where I could learn things that are interesting to me. And that could be literally anything. I'm trying to figure out how to set up video in my kitchen right now so that I could have um, my partner teach me how to make sourdough bread, right? I want to get my my favorite bartender here in town to come over and teach us how to make a cocktail because I just lo- like, I love this idea of being able to do whatever is interesting um, and not be, you know, like, I, I think what, what makes a, what makes for a good life is pursuit of curiosity and the freedom to pursue curiosity so that's a like a very abstract thing for me, but it it's ultimately come down to like, you know, once you once you start to hit the the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like what it what, you know, self-actualization being the top, like you've got food, shelter, water, you know that you're you're financially comfortable enough. So now you start looking at like what does self-actualization mean? And for me, it's basically become build a community and try to like learn. Just learn as much as you can. And by the way, pure pursuit of curiosity.com is available. Just <laughs> and, and I, and I actually, I absolutely love that. The, uh, the fact that you want to make your, your channel be on YouTube, what you're sharing in general, be more than just code. And I think like it's so, uh, there's so many places and on YouTube, so many channels that they focus in and zero on. I am, uh, I don't know, mobile phones, I am fashion, I am, you name it. 
Um, and it gets very boring to watch and to have somewhere that you could go to that album oh, this week. I'm learning about Gatsby next week. I'm learning how to mix a cocktail. And uh, mm-hmm. it sounds pretty awesome and something that you know, I personally would love to you know, watch. Not a lot of people do that. I know like uh, the Charlie Marie's like she's really good at that. Oh, yes. Life yes. And travel and all that. Like I love her channel and um, Femka as well. Uh, speaking yeah. Of that. So, yeah so. definitely that yeah they definitely are that way i also i i watched one of your recent gatsby ones uh the other day uh you're building the, the showcase site and you're uh, you showed how connecting the glitch and it was it, it's it's funny to watch someone else code because especially in there they need they're trying to find something in the interface you're trying to find how to add a package i was like the button's right there the button's and, right there uh, <laughs> yeah well that's and that's one of the things i love the most about it is because you know at any given moment there they're like dozens of people watching this thing live right and they, they've got access to a chat room and so i'm watching people help tease me they can play sound effects um we've we've pulled clips out of the show so when when i do something that you know, if I, if I mess something up, they've got a clip of me complaining about a computer that they can trigger. So, you know, it, I, I get to listen to myself arguing with a computer triggered by the audience. So it's this really wonderful collaborative live experience where I've got a guest and the guest and I are working on something and there's an audience, but it's not just like, we're not doing a presentational show. It's very interactive. We'll source ideas from the audience. We, I just learned how to do giveaways. So I can, uh, I can you know, give away a t-shirt for, if the person works at a company, we can give away some swag for their company. Or if I've got something relevant, you know, we can give away something relevant to the show. And that has been so much fun because it just means, you know, it just opens up all these doors for, things like inside jokes, like, you know, the whole Blitz Jackson thing is a, an inside joke that spawned in the community. Um, so the, it's, it's really been a rewarding experience. Do, do you mind just saying what that joke is for the people that are going, yeah, okay, so what is that? So, yeah, so the, the Blitz Jackson joke is, um, I have a weird last name. It's, it's Langsdorf, it's spelled weird. It's got too many consonants and not enough vowels. And there's a, a, kind of a, almost a meme at this point, when I go on to a podcast or somebody else's show or someone writes an article that mentions me, almost inevitably my name will be spelled wrong. And um, Swix, Sean Wang made a joke that, uh, that because I have a, you know, I have such a difficult to spell name that I needed some kind of a pseudonym or like a nom de plume for, for when I go do public appearances. And the joke was that my pseudonym was gonna be Blitz Jackson. Um, which I liked because I thought it made me sound like a weatherman. Uh, I've been told that it makes me sound more like a professional wrestler, which I've decided to steer into. I now I'm a now Blitz Jackson is a professional wrestler, but whose persona is a weatherman. I, I love that. So, what, what's your uh, weatherman move? What's the takedown called? Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, like, I guess I could I could pull out a green screen and then I could walk out in front of it and be like, like, oh, it looks like rain tonight, and then put him in a headlock or. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. You need like the virtual uh, ring too, and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, and, uh, what, what you were talking about the uh, the icons. I love the icon when somebody subscribes to the uh, channel. The the. Oh yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah. I've um, yeah. So I, I put together like these animated uh, animated gifs of of just me doing something silly, and whenever somebody subscribes, that those one of those little loop videos plays or. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at, apparently there's like fair use where we can pull in other sound effects. So it's not just me. My main concern is I always, I'm always worried about like takedown notices on YouTube where somebody's gonna be like, Oh, you used a clip from this movie. You have to take down that video. So we're, we're trying to figure out the, my, um, the, my viewers were like, Oh, you can use it like fair use if it's used in parody. And, I, and so now we're trying to figure out what that means and and how to make sure that I'm not opening myself up for like, Oh, just kidding. Your last seven episodes have to come down because you used a clip from some movie. That's good. That's great. That's great. I, I, yeah, I love, uh, I love when streamers do fun things like that where they, you can, and especially you allow the community to engage more by providing things like that. And um, I, Oh, I want to get back to the, the stream that you did because I was super excited and interested in, and at work we use live share for a pair of programming and VS code because it's oh yeah great, great for code reviews. And I had no idea that you could 
interface with glitch mm-hmm. from VS Code, and, and it's and and it can, you can connect to GitHub. It's like this whole like pathway, and it's all and then you can share the glitch. Uh, I guess project. I don't know, really know what you call the whole thing uh, with anyone, and they can watch you program and. But uh, that's super awesome. It's so amazing. I had no idea you could do that. Yeah, I've been wanting to do more of that. It's it's a little challenging because Twitch operates on a delay. So it's a few seconds behind. And so if you're watching the glitch and the Twitch, which also it's confusing <laughs> to have both Twitch and Twitch going at the same time. Um, but if you're if you're watching glitch, things will happen like two or three seconds before we explain what's happening. <laughs> and so it can get a little bit wild. Um but it is, I mean, it is really fun. And I love that idea of, of kind of collaboratively coding and um, something that I wanted to try on Glitch that I haven't had a chance to do is you can um, you can basically highlight something and, and do what they call raising your hand where you can say, somebody help me with this, right? So I thought it would be really fun to have the audience help me write portions of the code as we were going through it. Um, it's an experiment that's like, it stressed me out because of the time delay and everything. So I, I need to... I need to figure out exactly how that would work and then go back in and try it again. But um, I, I feel like there's so many opportunities for just amazing collaborations if if I can figure out a way to do it. And I think a lot of it's just going to be trying it and being okay when it goes horribly wrong. Yeah, it, that could go. Yeah, that could really backfire on you. Just <laughs> air programming with the internet. Um, and I also saw in that that same video, and I've seen in other videos that you do. I, where some other things I want to talk about, but I want to highlight your Figma user, and that's awesome because I yeah Figma. I'm an advocate locally. I run the meetup locally, and I, I'm always excited to see someone else using it. Um, but we've kind of like hinted at it and touched on it here and there. Uh, and you mentioned that you work there and how you started working with Gatsby. But um, for our listeners who are like, "What is this Gatsby?" I know it's a great book, um, but mm-hmm. what what is Gatsby? Did you say a great? Did you have to go with a great Gatsby? Was that the joke you were making? Yes, I went. Okay. okay. Yeah. Dad joke, man. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Gatsby is a, uh, it's a, a framework for building high performance websites with a really good developer experience. So the, the general idea is that modern web experiences are, um, they can be complex to set up. You, you feel like just to get a web something up on the internet, you've got to install Webpack and install Babel and, and get these different configurations running. And then you've got to figure out how to do a build process and a deployment step and you get to get a server going. And then if this thing gets any kind of traction, you're like, well, how do I do I, what is horizontal scaling? How do I scale a node server? Um, and all of that is really challenging, right? But if we can just deploy static assets, like if I take an index.html file and put it on, a CDN that scales. It's uh, it's not connected to a server, so the server can't go down. CDNs are built to handle massive load, so you know you don't have to scale that. So Gatsby is a way to build websites in React that are then compiled down to static assets that you can just deploy to a CDN. Um, the the cool part about Gatsby and what I really love about it is uh, on two sides. First, on the development side, it can aggregate data from pretty much any backend where, you know, you can, we've got um, what we call source plugins where you can pull in data from WordPress. You can pull in data from uh, your, your favorite APIs. You can, you can pull it in from software as a service product. So if you're using Airtable or you're using, um, I mean, what, like anything, YouTube, you're using, uh, yeah, Contentful, Flickr, Strappy, whatever. Um, all of those, you can, you can just install their source plugins, add your, your like token or your, um, your, your user config. And we pull that into a centralized data layer. So for your front end developers, all of the data comes from the same place, regardless of what the actual backend is. It comes from these Gatsby GraphQL queries. And as you build those, then at, uh, when you actually run the build of the site, we, run those queries, compile that data down, make it available in a static asset, and then you can ship all that to your CDN. And that happens in such a way that you don't need to run a server while you're you're functioning. So you get all of this amazing data from all over the place, pull your data from wherever you want to keep it. And then you still get to deploy to a CDN as if it was like just, you know, you're writing an index.html. 
So that's a huge benefit. And, and it opens up the door for these amazing collaborative opportunities because your developer experience is really good. You have a, you get to use React, you're using GraphQL, which has a little bit of a learning curve if you've never used it before. But once it clicks, it's like truly a night and day experience in terms of, of just how nice it is to work with. Um, and then your marketing team is stoked because they don't have to change their platform. They just keep writing WordPress posts or they keep writing, uh, you know, the, the e-commerce team is still managing things in Shopify and they don't have to care where the site is, is deployed because the, you know, that's not their concern. They're managing inventory or they're managing blog posts. You, the front end developer are querying the, you know, the Shopify products and the WordPress blog posts, and those all go up on the same website. Um, but then when it hits the browser, another, the second part that I, that I really love is that it rehydrates into a fully functional react app. So you're shipping static assets, but it can still be a dynamic app. You can make asynchronous requests. You can set up shopping carts, authentication, um, you know, dashboards, all sorts of things that you would want to do. So you get it to my mind, you kind of get the best of all worlds. You have this really good content story where the data can come from anywhere. All of your teams can collaborate on whatever platform they want. The front end development team gets this amazing experience of being able to build using tools that are modern and well supported with a really strong community. Gatsby's got one of the best communities in open source. I absolutely adore everybody in that community. Um, and then you have the uh, this deployment story where you don't really need like a DevOps workflow. You can use something like Netlify. And with Netlify, you're like, hey, Netlify, here's my Git repo. And it's like, cool, every time you change that, we'll deploy a new site for you. Oh, also, it's free. So it's this like incredible experience that cuts, you know, like at IBM, we employed five people full time to handle DevOps. And I don't even want to know what we spent on infrastructure. Um, for some of the products that I'm seeing deployed with Gatsby, they have no one on DevOps and they spend zero dollars on infrastructure. So it, it's, it's a really, really kind of like fundamentally powerful shift in ways that you can bootstrap um, full apps, you know, you, you get to cut a whole bunch of steps out of that process. Yeah. One, since, since you're on the show and a, a Gatsby uh, developer advocate person, uh, I, I'm going to ask a, a question. I want to know um, themes. Mm -hmm. I, I've uh, looked at some of the training. I'm curious uh, to uh, someone getting into the Gatsby ecosystem. Uh, from an outsider's perspective, because I'm learning, I've been learning, um, themes kind of seem like a, a package that you're basically an NPM package, but it seems like it's more, what what is a theme? Uh, what makes it different? How would you explain that? So a, th a theme, like a plugin is a single unit of functionality. It would be like you, um, you want to install uh, a third-party script or you want to add data from WordPress or something. Um, a theme is like a bundle of functionality. It's, it's effectively a fully functional Gatsby site, but it's configurable and installable as a package. So if you look at like the, the kind of starter workflow that you'll see in a lot of projects where you say, you know, you're using Yeoman or you're, you're doing a create react app. When you, when you build it, it takes something and it, it spits out, new code and then that code kind of becomes your code and if you make changes then any upstream changes you have to manually institute you'll have to like migrate whatever new things into your code um so with gatsby themes the idea was we wanted to make whole websites shippable as npm packages so that i could install like gatsby theme blog and configure it to run it slash blog on my website. And then it'll inherit the theme from my site using something called theme UI. And if something changes upstream, Gatsby theme blog gets an update where it adds, I don't know, tag support or multi-author mm. support or something. If I was using the traditional way of doing this, I'd have to go in and like look at the diffs on GitHub and pull in the new code and, and make sure that it didn't conflict with my new code and however things had diverged over time. Um, with a theme, I just bump the package version and make sure that there were no breaking changes. That's it's like that's the goal, and it's still early days, so that's you know that's true most of the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. Still trying to figure out best practices as a community um, on like how to make things really shareable and composable. But that's the promise of Gatsby themes, and that's the potential of them. 
and, and why I think they're such a powerful thing. Man, I'll, this can be like a four or five hour episode, right? I can just keep asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, so, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay. I, a bunch. I don't want to take up. Go ahead. We, we call okay. that a Portland standoff. No, you go. No, you go. No, you go. No, you go. Um, yeah. So, how did the the your actual um, your learn with Jason uh, start? Like, when did you? actually start doing this um so when i when i was at gatsby as an employee i kind of in the early days of the company i was uh, i think the fifth hire around about then um i i i helped kind of design the company's core values and and we had a couple that that i was really passionate about one of them was you belong here which is the idea that like everybody is welcome in open source regardless of of background or technical experience or, or anything. Like if you're a beginner, you should be totally welcome in a public repo. Um, and the other one was work in the open. And this idea of like, do you, you know, do things in public because a lot of what's valuable about stuff is not the final artifact, but the process. So one of the things that we started early on was live streaming meetings. I, I just set up a Twitch account and I set up some meetings for planning. And I was like, do you guys mind if I stream this? And so we streamed it and it was odd. Like it was it, streaming a meeting is not something that I would necessarily recommend, but it was, it was where we started. So um, we streamed a couple people watched. We didn't really see a lot of value, but then I, I had to build something. I had some project that we needed to build for, for something that um, that was upcoming. And so I just turned on the stream while I built what I was doing. Um, and that went way better. That was way more interesting than meetings. And, and it seemed like people were more interested in seeing that. So then um, from there, I was like, okay, well, let's keep doing this. And then there was a project that I wanted to work on that somebody else was, was helping me with. So I was like, hey, let's pair program on a stream. And that was really like the first episode of, of Learn with Jason was, was I pair programmed with somebody to build a project. Um, and then I was like, that went really well. I really had a, like, it was so much fun it's way more fun to work with somebody to pair program with somebody than solo. Like I love the solo stuff. I still do solo streams. Um, but there's that like back and forth. There's that discussion. I get to learn new things. We're trying out stuff. Um, and so I love that idea so much that I was like, what if I just asked other people in the community to show me stuff that they know? Um, and since I was at Gatsby, I was like, well, let's talk to all these, these companies that partner with Gatsby and just have them come on and teach us how to use their tool with Gatsby. Um, and now that I'm not full-time with Gatsby anymore, uh, now it's just like literally anything that I'm interested in. I, I'm like, Hey, let's do this. Let's do something wild. Um, so I'm not just, it's not just like, let's build a thing that's compatible with Gatsby, but I'm like, yeah, let's, you know, let's make music. Let's, uh, let's, I'm going to try to get somebody from the view Vixens team to come on and teach me view. Cause I haven't really tried that at all. Right. Like I, there's so many cool things that, that are out there to do. And, um, you know, my, my goal is to learn a tiny little bit about all of them. <laughs> Let me ask you just one more question on this is who would be your favorite person to have as a co guest author on the, on the show? Oh, I have uh, the, the, that list is, I mean, there's no, no, so j many. just like immediately, like who, who would you like the first person that came to mind? Uh, I mean, the, the person that I'm most excited about that I've actually booked is um, Sarah Drasner. She's, you know, she's kind of one of my heroes in the web development community. She does some truly oh. like mind boggling stuff and she's going to come on and teach me three JS, which uh, I just did my very first animation stuff with Paul Henschel on a stream today. And that was super cool. I, I was totally blown away by the whole process. And Sarah wants to go deeper. She wants to do like auto generated 3d scenes. And I'm like, all right, let's do this. Um, but like, there's so many people that I want to get on the show. Like I would love to work with Mina Markham and do something like design. And cause she worked on Hillary Clinton's, um, pants yeah. system. I'd love to have her come on and talk about things like that. Uh, I'd love to get somebody from the react team to go do a deep dive on like suspense or something like that. Um, or, or, you know, do like, I want Anjana Vakil to come on, um, and teach me like Lambda calculus. She has this talk on the Lambda calculus that is like, 
I saw it at JS Heroes. It's so good. Um, and so I just wanted to come on and, and teach me. She builds a programming language from scratch in that talk. So I'm like, come do that on the show. Teach me. So <laughs> it's, it's so much fun to watch. Um, and the, yeah, there's just so many incredible people that I want to learn from. That's so awesome. I'm really excited to, uh, to watch some more of those. What, where, where, where can people go to, to uh, what's the prime URL for people to go to for the uh, listening audience? For that? Learn with Jason.dev is the the actual website that links out to um there's like twitch.tv slash jay langsdorf is where the streams happen and then they get cross posted to youtube um but the youtube stuff is all also posted on learnwithjason.dev so you should be able to find everything there awesome well we're getting uh close to the end of the show and i know brian has a spotlight question brian do you want to go ahead and jump into that Yes, I do. And this is a, uh, a group question. Uh, and, and we'll all go first. You go last. So you get to take a moment to think. Um, and so what it is, is I uh, ask the question, everyone answers. It's kind of a get to know you sort of question. Um, and this week, it's what is an irrational fear that you have? Um, mine is kind of not, ir- not irrational, but I kind of consider it irrational. It's Deep ocean water. I went to uh, Key West a couple of years ago, and it was um, it. We did scuba diving, <laughs> and it, I was hyperventilating into my uh, uh, what was things called snorkel uh, the entire time I was in the water, but enjoying it, but freaking out <laughs> as well. <laughs> like, is there going something going to kill me? She's like weeping and just saying, I'm having a really good time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is the best. Uh, okay. <laughs> Which one of you next? Out of a tree. I'll go next. Mine is lions, uh, big cats, basically. I have nightmares, and somebody could analyze this. I have nightmares about lions and big cats, like at least, I don't know, like four or five times a week, where I encounter a big lion or a big cat. And then I think of how I'm going to take it out and how to defend myself and punch it in the eyes, doing the ear thing, rolling with it. Like, I don't know it's why. Not gonna happen. It's not gonna yeah, happen. I, it might not happen, but like for some <laughs> reason, I always have that dream all the time. So that's how, mine. How big does this cat have to be? Like, is an overfed tabby in danger? If you find it in an alley, you're going like, to tackle it. And <laughs> it it might. My, my my wife will joke with you about how once a butterfly jumped out and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I am, I am jumpy. I'm, I'm not the guy you want to sneak up behind and go, boo, that's don't do that to me. But I have a story about that, but that's for, I don't want to dig, dig, digress too far, but anyway, yeah. Lions for me, Sarah. Lions is definitely irrational. I think I think being afraid of drowning in the ocean is pretty rational, Brian. So I don't know it's if that counts. Drowning. I don't it's know. The, um, just what's there? It's going yeah, to but I mean, you don't know what's down there. I mean, there's some there's some yeah. creepy stuff down there. So, Stop it. Um, mine is <laughs> mine is pretty basic. I don't have a lot of of phobias or fears. Um, I am also very jumpy, so don't surprise me because I will punch you in the face. <laughs> um, and I will not feel bad about it. I will be angry at you for like a week. Um, my kids have learned that the hard way um, when they try to joke oh, with mom. But my, no, no lies. No, like, but my irrational fear, I think, is pretty pretty ubiquitous. Like I'm afraid of heights. Um, and mm. I've gotten better over time. But there was a point in time where I'd get on a step ladder and I'd be like, you know, and I, to the point where I just like, I almost have like this, like, I want to jump off and just get it over with. Like, I know I'm going to die because I'm a pie. So I might as well just get it over with a jump. It's like this really crazy anxiety thing that I have, but it's gotten better. But I went to um, Utah to, uh, oh my God, where the heck is that place? It's amazing. There's a huge national park. The Badlands are out there. Park Zion? Anyway. Uh, wait, say it again. Zion? Some... Canyonlands? Parches? No. Moab. <laughs> that one place. Moab. 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 We are in Moab and we were, we were out hiking and everything was fine. And then I realized that we were really high and I just immediately like got to the ground. And like I, I had to like crawl back until I felt like I was far enough away because I just, I didn't trust myself not to just like be like, it's all over now and just go. <laughs> so... Yeah, pretty irrational, but uh, your turn, Jason. 
Uh, mine is, so I, <laughs> I'm afraid of ghosts. And like, this is extra irrational for me because I don't actually believe in ghosts. So uh, I, I have this like, I don't like it when things don't make sense. And I feel like there are all sorts of like laws of physics and, and things that regulate how the world works. But if you ever watch ghost stories, ghosts don't follow those rules. They go through walls. They can move huge distances in short times to do jump scares. Like all of these things that shouldn't be possible happen with ghosts. And it always freaks me out because like I watched um, one episode of, I think it's called The Haunting of Hill House. It was that Netflix series that had like Good. a I billion ghosts in it and i was shitting my pants oh my I think it's god yeah. yeah i watched so my partner also doesn't like ghosts but she was like oh it's everybody said this is so good we've totally got to watch it the writing is going to be amazing it was good and i was like you know this isn't going to work i'm not going to sleep for like days if we watch this show <laughs> i can't do this and she was like, come on, just watch one episode with me. And so we watched one episode and, and um, you know, there's this like jump scare at the end of the episode that I cleared the couch getting away from the tea. I like <laughs> went over the back of the couch to like get out of that room. And I was like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Like yeah, turn this that. off. So Frederick's lion will eat your ghost while jumping off of a high building into the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> we made a story apparently that was pretty good we, we're running really low on time but i want to get to our lightning round so this is going to be questions that we ask you really quick it's going to go brian sarah me and we're going to ask you some questions quick answers two minutes around the clock brian go firefox or chrome chrome but only because i'm lazy <laughs> do you any pets I don't have any pets. I'm uh, too selfish to get a dog, but I really want one. But I like favorite cartoon. Favorite cartoon as a kid. Oh boy, what was it? Um, I actually don't know. I don't remember what cartoons I watched as a kid. Favorite Ninja cartoon Turtles, now. What, what did you say? What? Ninja Turtles, probably. I think I watched a lot of the Ninja Turtles. Fair enough. What was your favorite fairy tale growing up? Um, I, Hansel and Gretel. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really weird one, Brian. All right, guilty pleasure. Uh, eating an entire pizza by myself while watching Netflix. Nice. Mine's unsolved mysteries, so I got you there. <laughs> Jason, you come home. It's one in the morning. It's dark. It's stormy. You're no one's else is home. You come home, you open the front door, and there's a ghost. What do you do? What do you do? Burn the house down, change my name, move to another state. <laughs> Very acceptable. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I think with that, we're probably at the end of the 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 spotlight or the right lightning round. Unless you're you're anybody else. No, oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. All right, Jason. Uh, I just want to provide you a uh, an opportunity here for any kind of parting words words of wisdom anything that you want to bestow upon our audience um yours yeah i i think i i love this community i love seeing people out trying to make each other feel better so make sure that you are being kind and using your platform to lift up people who need it um yeah what's the in the words of bill and ted be excellent to each other <laughs> love it nice and uh what's the best way people could find out more about you where should they go i have a website at langstorff.com which is going to be information about me and my writing which is more on the the i call it armchair philosophy and then i've got learn with jason.dev uh for the code things and uh if you just want to watch me talk about things that i'm doing twitter.com slash j langstorff nice Anyone else? No, just uh, thank you for being on the show and taking the time to talk to us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was a blast. Yeah, I really appreciate you joining us, Jason. And thanks everyone for watching. Remember again, please subscribe, click the notification button to get notifications when we have new uh, live streams coming out. Thanks everybody for watching.